You're watching the Original Music Podcast with your hosts Raymond Hems and Rick Gaffman. Here we go, episode 48. Today we have uh, Mitch Fossier, uh, who is a uh, singer-songwriter uh, out of the Atlanta area. Uh, how are you doing today, uh, Mr. Mitch? I'm good, man. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Hey, it's good to see you too. Full disclosure, uh, uh, we've probably known each other for 10, 15 years. Something like that. Uh, but yeah, we've yet, we've yet to do a show together. What, <laughs> what's up with that? This is a first, there's no doubt, yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you just finished an album. Uh, it's called Like We Were Told. And you and I have been talking music probably a year and a half, two years. How long have you been working on the album? Uh, unfortunately, longer than that. Yeah. Uh, I'm ashamed to admit. Yeah, I started recording um, the album in my senior year of college. Yeah. Um, and then went through the whole process, mixed everything, got finished with it. I was like, wow, this sounds awful. And was like, I, I guess I just realized sort of my incompetence going through the entire process. So ended up going back, scrapping a lot of things, redoing things. Um, so yeah, it took, it took a few more years than that. So um, yeah, I just finished, I'm three years removed from college or maybe even coming on four. So uh, yeah, by like by the time the process ended, it was probably close to four years. Um, granted, a lot of that was just me sort of learning and yeah, uh, trying to figure out some things. So the recording process, you kind of kind of did it trial uh, trial and error kind of a thing. What what first off, let's talk about the the DAW that you use to record everything with. Um, what do you use? I'm a Logic guy. Kind of grew up with that and studied with that a lot in school. So. Um, that's what I've always used and probably what I'll continue to use. Yeah. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I, it, once you get on a platform and you learn that platform, it is so hard to talk yourself into going to something else. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just don't see like, I, I mean, I suppose the industry standards are probably pro tools, but um, I don't know. You can do everything in logic and I like the interface. It's clean. Um, and I don't really see a reason to switch at this point. Yeah. Well, you know, it's an Apple product, so you, you know it's always going to work on an Apple machine uh, what, what, yep. with whatever updated um, operating system that they, they, they come out with. So that's, that's a big bonus because I'm, yeah. I'm actually locked into an older version of Pro Tools that I can't, I can't update my operating system on my computer because my Pro Tools would not run on it. And, and you know, that, that's... Yeah. A dilemma that, that we always run into with the with the DAWs and stuff. Um, so yeah, especially with plugins and stuff too. It's just plugins, turned into a mess. Yeah, I think um, I had Mike Bartison and we were talking about plugins, uh, and he's he he's like, once you get your machine running, turn off auto updates and never update. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I've run into that problem a time or two. Yeah, it's brutal. Um, so how much of the album that you recorded, and you went to the University of Maine, correct? Correct. And, uh, and I would imagine it's cold in the winter. Did you do a lot of writing in the wintertime up there or what? Um, yeah, I mean, just being in college, it's sort of, I mean, you're like specifically, you know, playing hockey up there and stuff. Um, you know, you're so busy. So I think a lot of my writing probably came, um, in the summer when it was a little more relaxed, but, nice. um, Definitely, yeah. I mean, there's definitely some cold nights where you pick up a guitar and start yeah. writing. And um, yeah, honestly, it's it's so long ago now; it's hard to remember. I know. Yeah, songs, songs. You go. Have you ever gone gone back to a song and been like, "Oh, how did how did I play that?" And have to relearn oh, your your own stuff all the time. I, even the songs on this album right now. You know, I've had people ask me to play them, and I'm like, um, I'd have to figure that out, and then you know, then we can get back to that song. Yeah. And I'm sure it would come back quick, but. A lot of those songs, 
yeah, like I could definitely could not play them off the top of my head right now. Right. And, uh, well, that's the difference. Um, you know, like we just did, a, we're just in the middle of an album released as well, doing singles. And I had to, I had to go back and man, how did I play that to, yeah. to get it ready to be able to perform it live is, a you know, cause you can do things in the studio, uh, yeah, and you know, take a part from here and a part from there, particularly in my guitar solos and go, okay, those work nice together. Now, how do I play that? <laughs> you know? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And yeah, you, know, you try different things and see what works and give yourself options. And you're right. By the time you come up with a finished track, it's like, shoot, what did I do here? How did I do that? <laughs> right. And how do I pull it off live? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you talked a little bit about, you know, the writing process. Does it typically, um, does it typically start for you with just picking up the uh, acoustic guitar and do, jotting down lyrics or do you do write some lyric ideas and then the guitar or how, how do you typically write i think for me it only starts with a melody um and that can come in in a few different ways i think sometimes it's just picking up a guitar and messing around and you know you, you stumble upon something you like um i know a way for me that like has consistently um come up which I think is maybe a little strange is like if I hear a song for the first time, like someone else's song and like, it doesn't go where I think it's going to go. I'll just stop listening and start writing based off of where I think a song should go. Oh, uh, right. like melodically speaking. Nice. Um, so I think for me, or even just, you know, hearing something, I'll, you know, my phone is filled with a million different voice memos of, yep. Um, you know, me humming little stuff, just melodies to remember for later. So I'd say it normally starts with that. And um, it's normally built on an acoustic guitar just because that's, um, you know, what I'm most fluent on. Um, and then lyrically, I would say, um, yeah, like different lines will come to me here and there. And I, you know, my notes are full of different ideas and, and lines. Um, and yeah, I feel like it's normally melody first, though. And then, you know, maybe a line will come and yeah. it'll kind of build off of that. Um, and kind of build from there, I guess. Yeah. That, uh, it seems to be a very common thing, uh, talking to different people about their process. Uh, <laughs> the note, the notes app on the iPhone and the voice memo app on the iPhone are probably a, a writer's most utilized scratch pad. Um, yeah. And that, and that kind of seems to be a common thing all the way from everybody that I'm talking to. I use it all the time for, um, you know, riffs and guitar parts. Yeah, I'm like, for sure. Man, I've never played that before, and I've been playing so long. I need to record that. You know. Um, yeah, I mean, at least for me too. If I don't like get it down immediately, like it's gone forever. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah I got to get it down quick. If you ever tried to think about how many songs or ideas that you've forgotten, I mean, it, it, yeah. yeah, it could be all. I mean, thousands. I would say. Um, yeah. Well. When you say melody, uh, are you, it could be either a guitar melody or a vocal line melody. Is that? Yeah. 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 No, yeah, that's fair to say. It could be, it could be even like a riff melody. Just, I would say that's kind of instinctually where, I think that's the first thing that sticks out to me too when I hear other people's music. Yeah. Um, I think that's what first grabs my attention and that seems to be where I sort of start writing as well. Yeah. Well, it's, um, you know, melodies a pretty important part of music and uh it sure is you know if you're you know it's a, i guess a little bit different thing if you're 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 doing edm or if you're doing rap or that kind of stuff um not not so melodically uh you know driven music but uh you, your stuff is definitely um your your stuff has definitely got great melody uh like it's like i said just the the three tracks that, that we're going to play today uh you did the right thing if you weren't happy with the the initial um you know quality of the record because this stuff sounds great um appreciate it it, it really does it, it really to you know and I, i've known you a long time but it it really shows that you took your time and 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 every aspect and every detail of every part of a song you know <laughs> you worked on until you had it the way you wanted it for sure you know it's very good appreciate it appreciate it um, when did you, uh, first pick up a guitar and, and what was, who inspired you or what inspired you to, uh, to, to start playing? Yeah, I had, uh, I had neighbors when I was pretty young, um, that played music and I just remember being 
um, over their house and seeing them play. And I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. So I'd say that was probably the initial spark. Um, and, you know, pretty, pretty shortly after, you know, tried to kept asking my parents if they'd get me a guitar and eventually they did. Um, so learned a few songs and I think I kind of drifted away from it for a while. Um, and then sort of figured out what like, you know, home recording was, right. um, and was, you know, somehow stumbled upon videos of that maybe on YouTube or something. Right. Um, and was watching people record their own stuff and I'm like, Oh, that would be so cool. So got like a cheap interface and a cheap mic and started messing around with that. And I think once I did that, I was, I was probably, you know, 13 or something at the time. Right. Um, and from there on out, like never stepped away from it, just kind of fell more and more in love with it. Um, so that was sort of, I would say kind of what really, really kind of, I don't know, sparked or, you know, drove me to where I'm at now. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think I knew how important, um, well, I don't think I knew how important capturing your music properly and as good as you can was until, and I'm dating myself now, uh, around 98, 99, um, I got my first computer that ha it, it could burn a CD and it was just groundbreaking um, to be able to, to, you know, record something to, to a CD uh, instead of, we were using cassettes and, and crazy stuff, you know, old stuff. Um, but I am the same like you. The recording process, uh, in, in spite, it, it, it bit me as much as the guitar did back in when I first started playing guitar. Um, and I think if you're going to be an artist, you have to learn how to record yourself. These, and these days, it's easier, easier than ever. Yeah, it, it is. And at the same time, like at least for me, I think I drastically like, you know, underestimated the nuance that goes into it. And you can have so many, you know, pieces of the puzzle. Right. But if you've got one thing off, it can ruin a recording. So, yeah. um, and I think that was one of the things that I realized too, just when I started recording this album and I was, um, you know, just unhappy with the, like a lot of, like the way that a lot of things were turning out. And I just realized that I was sort of, you know, maybe not honing in on some of the details that I needed to, to get, you know, a specific tone or sound that I wanted. Yeah. And, and I, one of my, one of my sayings is, uh, everything cool in music, whether it's microphones or guitars or drum sets or uh, everything costs a thousand dollars, you know, it, it takes thousands and thousands of dollars of investment in yourself just to record a track, uh, you know, and then there's the time investment, uh, which you're talking about you know, very specific details in the recording process, EQing one instrument slightly different can make or break a, a, a recording, you know? Um, so we had talked in the past about uh, some new technology in the recording pro process, um, the virtual microphones and stuff like that. Uh, can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about some of the gear that you um, like to use on these tracks? Yeah, uh, so I ended up tracking all the vocals with what you just alluded to, the like Slate ML1 large diaphragm microphone, which is um, an emulation microphone emulating kind of old classic large diaphragm condensers. Um, and then I used actually a pair of the ML2, which are uh, small diaphragm microphones by, you know, under the same idea, emulations um, of, you know, sort of classics, mm -hmm. um, just because it was a lot more... Um, you know, cost friendly. And honestly, just hearing shootouts with those things, it's, it's pretty impressive what they can do. It really is. Um, but yeah, I mean, like just what you said, like, I think that like uh, the biggest thing for me that I've realized too, is it's like, I think at least this was like sort of subconscious in my perspective was when I was recording a lot of things, I was like, you know, I'll clean that up with EQ or, mm -hmm. you know, I'll clean that up after, like, I just need a strong signal. And it's like, I just think that couldn't be further from the truth. Like, if you want something to sound good, like you have to track it well. And I think even if, you know, like you watch videos with, of like, you know, behind the scenes with like some of the best producers in the world, you hear like the stems and the tracks that they have coming in the door. It already sounds phenomenal. Right. right. And it's like, they're not sitting there just cleaning up problem after problem. Um, which granted, like the technology we have access to, you can clean up a lot of problems pretty, and it's pretty impressive and convincing. But I mean, if you want the best product possible, you've got to like, you've got to track it well. Like, and I think of like, even, you know, tracking acoustic guitars, it's like, you know, 
like another uh, I have a uh, Neve uh, 73 it's by Heritage though so it's sort of an emulation or not an emulation but just a you know a take on it mm-hmm. um, it's just a nice um, nice preamp um, and that's going into my Claret interface um, and you know great cables and kind of had to you know planned everything out but like my mic was too close to the sound hole and I was getting so much low end and like these acoustics and by the time like you cut all of that out to make it fit in a mix it just sounds like thin and unnatural it's like a little you know move that mic six inches to the left and it's like all of a sudden it's a different story so just the attention to detail that i think you know you realize you need to have going through this process is pretty eye-opening well uh capturing acoustic guitar is is not an easy feat uh to get it proper you know uh you know there's a lot of um you know electronics like my takamini has a um you know electronics in it um so you know, I cheat and I just plug, plug it in and plug into, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a VST and, yeah. and get some sounds that way. But the combination of plugging in, um, using the electronic feet line and then miking the sound hole, um, blending the two together, that's kind of like when I'm really trying to capture my acoustic, that's kind of how I approach it. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I find is... Uh, uh, putting the mic ar- around the 12th fret, not in, right in front of the sound hole, but more a little bit sure. up up the uh, fretboard uh, and about uh, 12, 16 inches away from my mic sound. And then I blend that too. But it is, it, you're using, do you have electronics in your acoustics, A, and then B, yeah. and then B, uh, do you do, Multi, do you do do that type of thing blend the two i uh so like what you just like suggested i've done that in like live recordings i think that works really well especially because just the bleed you're gonna get from everything else right but i think it depends on the kind of music like that you're playing and i like i think with your stuff um like which has a lot more rock influence and a lot more going on like you're probably using you know that acoustic maybe for like more shimmer yeah where a lot of times you no. Know, I'm playing an acoustic and that's what it is. Um, so I like, yeah, I try to stay away if I'm doing, you know, a studio recording, I try to stay away from a pickup just because it does have sort of a distinct sound. Um, but I, I, and again, like, I think I got kind of lost down the rabbit hole of like, I was, I was using two mics, um, actually even three mics. I was trying all this stuff. Yeah. Um, and when you do that, you just, you open up the door to so many, like, you know, the phase and, yeah. and a million different other problems. Um, but, and yeah, there's, there's just so much that goes into it. Like, and even like the instrument itself, it's like, you know, you know, did you get it tuned up? Like, um, obviously like in tune, but I mean like, you know, is the action right? Is the saddle sitting right? Like, are the strings new? Like, is the, you know, like you have to have the angle in mind. Like, are you using a pick? Are you just using your hand to strum? Like for yeah. things like that. And yeah. it's like, that's all going to affect how, this this track fits into the rest of the mix um but yeah as far as recording acoustic like i think the next time i go through this process um i I think i'll probably just use one mic to be honest um and just be super super um you know specific and aware of you know i'll I'll do a lot of pre you know pre-work there and figuring out what what i like the sound of and um yeah, I don't know. I'm excited to go through the process again, though. I think it'll Good. be a lot easier and just obviously I, I'm a lot more knowledgeable than I was when I, you know, went through the last project just, you know, by nature. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that, that's what this is all about. It's a lifelong um, learning curve. Uh, and just when you think you have something learned pretty good, you feel pr- pretty proficient with it. Boom, they change the technology technology, and uh, <laughs> and come out with some new stuff that Oh no! Now I got to learn that and see how it, yeah. how to put that into the process. Um, well, that's awesome, man. I, I, I I've kind of you know seen you on this journey of the curiosity of uh, what do you think about this mic and or what you know how you know just really detail oriented learning your craft um, and it's it's been fun to watch. Um, but the other thing. That uh, at the beginning of the show, I, I, I played a clip of a song called Landslide. Um, <laughs> and, and that's when I saw that video that I knew that um, 
not only were you f- for real taking this for really oh serious, um, but your voice, man, your voice is uh, one. It, it's your own thing, man. I, I can't say, oh, he sounds like so and so, or he sounds like so and so. You really have your own style. When did you a learn how that you had a voice? Because I think that's that's I I don't, <laughs> and, and so I never tried to work on it. Um, but when did you learn that you could sing? And uh, did you did you just always sing like that? Um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I think it's such a weird thing for anyone to hear their voice. Like, I don't. It's so funny. Like, I remember um, I saw one of my like all time favorite artists play live, um, and he like he kind of like went off the face of the earth for a few years, and then he played this show and he didn't like advertise at all. He was opening up for someone. My brother somehow found out. He's like, dude, I think this is, you know, this, this artist. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go. And so we went and it was him. And we ended up like chatting with him, uh, for a while after the show. Yeah. And like, he has like one of my favorite voices. Like, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And, uh, we were talking about like the same thing. I'm like, dude, like, cause he didn't start, he was like, yeah, I didn't start writing music till I was like 21. And I'm like, why? Like how? And, uh, he's I'm like, did people not like tell you like your voice was unbelievable? He's like, oh, like I wouldn't sing for anyone like i'd sing in the shower and i'm like he's like i thought i sound like a 13 year old girl i'm like that's insane to me and like i don't think that anyone really has a good grasp on like how good or how bad their voice is like i think it's this really weird thing where it's like you almost have to take people's word for it um so like i started doing it just because like i loved it like i thought it was fun like singing was fun and i wanted to be able to pick up a guitar and play songs and sing songs and you know eventually like you know, I'd play a song here and there for someone and they'd be like, Oh, like I didn't expect that. Like, you know, you're, you actually have a really good voice. And I'm like, like, you're just saying that to me. Cause, cause we're friends or something. So I, yeah. it's, it's kind of like a weird, I don't know. It's a weird thing. And like, I still don't like, I don't really know if my voice is good or not, but I yeah. guess some people like it. So I guess I'm going to keep doing it. Um, but I think that was maybe sort of a realization that I at least have some, singing ability i still don't really know how much but um you know through high school and maybe early college and stuff yeah well uh, you know pitch pitch you know i mean you're always on pitch you've got your own style of vibrato um and and just delivery on all all the way around it it's your own thing and um i i'm envious of that oh that you you can't you've got the ability to uh man you hear it you know oh that's mitch i got i i know i know that um, well, let's, let's, let's take a listen to a track. We're going to play, uh, give me some more. And, um, can you tell me to set this up a little bit, uh, with, uh, some, but you had some buddies play on it and what's the, what's yeah. the story? Uh, the recording or like the song itself, the song itself, the recording, whatever the song itself was, uh, I wrote it in college. So I, yeah, I guess I did write some songs in college and yeah. it was, uh, it was, I guess, just about, there was a, just a lot of drama going on in a friend group. Um, and I was sitting there with this melody, like in my bedroom and I just had like cheesy college posters up, um, in my, in my room. Um, and I had like a Beatles poster, uh, like a John Lennon poster or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was just sitting up there and I'm like, gosh, I bet like all of these guys had the exact, like just the same it's the same cycle of everything. Like I'm sure there was the same drama going on in every friend group everywhere. So that was sort of how the song uh, began, but it was just sort of like kind of almost me just making fun of maybe the situation that all my friends were in. Um, and then the recording process itself, um, my buddy uh, Nathan cook played drums on it. Um, and another buddy, Isaac George played um, he played the solo in it and the, the riff um I'm trying to think who else played on on it. the electric yeah, yeah on yeah. the electric um there was some backup vocals done by caroline russell nice um i played you know the other guitars i played the bass uh i played the organ um i don't know i'm sure when i hear it i'll i <laughs> gotta remember what the song like i haven't listened to it in a month so yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I'll hear some things as we hear it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's take a listen. Uh, give me some more, Mitch Bossier. Bobby strikes clear with his chin in the air on a wall. Look 
Looking back at me Johnny psychedelically flaunts his dreams On every piece of merch released And Polly's calling shots in the same routine This girl down his throat But he just wants to sing And everybody's to play And all the same history Repeats itself through every streak And all the girls they come out to play I could see some romance in your eyes A genuine smile some strange disguise Every figure seems better than before Give me some more Give me some more That's very well done, man. Very, well, you should be very proud of that track. Um, the uh, a couple of notes I have on here: the guitar separation that you have going on, um, you know, with one guitar part here and one part. It's I get I love listening to these tracks that people bring in because I'm in it with my in ears. I really hear where things are placed and mixes, and uh, and I really like the separation on on that. How did you record those electric guitars? Uh, those were all DI. Um, so yeah, directly into my, uh, interface and then was using like software amps. Um, and yeah, there's quite a few, like there's, you know, the main guitar that I played throughout the entire thing. Um, I think is in the left here, if I remember correctly. Yeah, there's, there's, um, yeah. and then the riff is in the right ear. And then there's also, I played, um, you know, I did some doubling, at certain parts in the song to kind of fill out some space with, you know, one far right, one far left. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, on sort of the panning spectrum, but the main, the main guitar, I think is like, you know, kind of halfway this way. And then the riff is like halfway this way. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it was all DI, all, um, software amps. Yeah. Um, it, th- how so, about, yeah. how about, how about those rabbit holes of, uh, using the, oh, the my, software oh. amps and, it's awful. Yeah. There's too many options. It's like the best thing in the world, but it's also like, yeah. oh, you can sit there for hours and hours, which I most certainly did. Like, yeah. And then you, you know, you bring it down to a handful, and you're like, oh man, I don't know. So yeah. Well, the one thing I do like about recording with virtual amps 
is, um, you know, I can record with this one amp sound, um, and maybe three weeks later when I'm mixing, you know what, I, I, it, it was either too much gain, not enough gain, or maybe I want to try a different amp. It's a non-destructive form of recording your guitar. You can go back and change, sure. change it. Um, you know, sometimes I'll just, I'll just uh, duplicate that track and then uh, change the amp on the duplicated track and then A, B, or blend. Sure. You know, you can do anything. Like, yeah. That's the fun part of, uh, you know, the recording process is like you, you really, your hands are not tied. Your, your brain, your, your ideas, you can go crazy with them. Uh, the canvas is always open. You know, that, that's what I love about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And like, you know, you just said, and like, yeah, I did a whole lot of what you just said. So, you know, duplicating A, B, yep. and A, B, C, A, B, C, D, like just yep. going down. And I think just in like production and mixing in general, though, like it's, it's so cool and so powerful, in it, but it's also like, there's a million different decisions to be made when you're producing and mixing a song. Yep. And at some point you just got to like, this is what I'm going with. Like, yeah. So I don't know. It's a fine line. At least for me, that's like a big, definitely like something that I've struggled with. It's like, there's just so many options and you know, there's not one correct way of doing it. Obviously there's a a million different ways to do it. Um, and you know, many of them can sound great. Um, so so definitely like there's just so many decisions to make. (laughs) Yeah, I know. It's crazy. Um, the, the other thing I noticed, uh, the toms, the, the drum kit in general, but the toms, he does a, he does a kind of a thunder roll kind of a thing going on. Yeah. Um, they sound so good, dude. They are, I mean, they're thick. They're, they're in the mix, sitting in the mix. Nice, you know, intentionally. Yeah. There. So I ended up, um, I ended up doing some drum, drum doubling for that. So I would like to say that my miking skills were phenomenal, yeah. but, and obviously, yeah. And the kit would have been unbelievable. Um, but my, my, my drummer's phenomenal, um, has such a great, great feel and, and, you know, taste for like what a song needs. Um, so he played it so well, but I ended up going back and doing some drum, uh, drum doubling. So still using, um, all the original recordings, but, um, using, you know, some MIDI as well to kind of fill that sound out. Um, and yeah, I thought, I thought that aspect of it actually worked nicely. Yeah, it works really nice. Uh, and you know, how many hours do you think you've sat in front of a MIDI, uh, piano roll, uh, on MIDI, on one particular track uh just to get it right you know yeah i mean obviously like logic makes it pretty easy as far as like they it gives you like the general idea of it like you just literally like track you know uh i don't know what the feature is called exactly but it's really like drum doubling or something replacement or doubling yeah and so it'll take the transient and give you a midi note there with velocity based off the transient which is you know pretty sweet um but you definitely have to go through and fine tune and it's not going to pick up everything. And it's going to add some notes that you're like, Nope, that doesn't belong there. So yeah. it's, it definitely, there's some monotonous just going through like, yeah, no, like, you know, going yeah. for that. I, I, I like that. Um, you know, uh, I just got done, got done doing it on a track, um, where I had, I had just a hi hat just kind of keeping time, uh, during quiet parts of a song. And I, you know, after listen after my listen through number uh, 136 i was like you know what it doesn't it doesn't even need that Cut, just let's boom delete all those uh, delete all yeah. those notes <laughs> i don't need them uh, so you know I, I like to kind of build my cake with a lot of ingredients and then slowly start taking things away um to to make room for things uh such as your voice on that track uh, the stereo separation of your guitars and, the, the, you know, how that if you're using the, the slate microphone on those lead vocals, I'm a fan. That, th- that sounded amazing. Um, but the stereo separation of the guitars really allowed your, your vocal to s- sit up in the middle, up in front nicely. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was definitely a bit of a challenge just because there is a lot going on, mm-hmm. just a lot of sound. Yeah. Um, so trying to, and I, my, my voice doesn't, I don't have like a piercing voice. It's pretty like, um, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it, but it doesn't like in a mix. I oftentimes have a hard time getting my voice to cut through just cause it doesn't yeah. really pierce through naturally. 
That's possibly because you're singing and not screaming. <laughs> that might be it. You, you know, could be onto something there. You know, that's, that's I need to start screaming more. No, no, you stay doing what you're doing. <laughs> um, uh, the reverb choice on the on the lead vocal uh, is not it's not too wishy washed out. It's not too dry. It's, it's got a is that when you find a preset in it, like for example that one, do you do you a save it and name it? Um, uh, and you do you use it a lot, or do you go for what each song needs reverb wise on your lead vocal? Um, I definitely like would start like I would start with like a general template and then kind of branch off from there. I would say so. Like I mean, all the songs have similar, um, you know, similar styles of of reverb, and I'm you know starting from the same place. But they definitely go in different places. Like actually, they give me some more is different than most of the other songs. There's a there's a lot of tape delay on those vocals actually. Mm. Um, so yeah, I was just sort of setting up uh, bosses to send send those vocals too so there's a lot of a lot of tape delay um and then uh little plate reverb yep. by sound is it sound toys i think um and then yeah i don't know it was a mixture of like a lot of different stuff and just sort of trial and error but um i mean definitely like it's not like i'm using different reverbs for every song like mm -hmm. that little plate is probably on yeah that's on every single right every single song um but some of the tape delay stuff on that one was sort of unique to it. Now, when you say tape delay, um, uh, you, you're using that for kind of widening the vocal. Um, it's not yeah, and just space. Like yeah. it's tape delay, pretty much sounds like reverb. It's just, yeah. it, it well, you know, somewhat right. Like just sort of that. I don't even really know how to describe it, but it has a pretty unique sound that definitely gives something. A very, like it's a unique sense of space, I guess. Yeah, it gives it width. Um, they used tape delay a lot back in like that that fifties sound. Um, you would hear. It, it wasn't typically a lot of times it wasn't reverb. It was actually tape delay, and it just kind of gave mm -hmm. it, gave it that nice wide uh, wide sound. Um, the other thing I had written down was um, the storm sound. What did you use? <laughs> what is? Yeah, that? I was going to mention that. I heard that too. I'm like, oh yeah, that was another thing I did. Uh, I actually did it on a few songs, but it's just like a noise sweep. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's all it is. And it just kind of sounds like wind, I yeah. guess. So yeah, it probably sounded like a storm there cause you got the toms going. Um, but I'm trying to think if it's, it was, you might hear, it was definitely a sweep. Yeah. It's yeah. A, just a, literally just a noise sweep. Like it's super elementary, but, um, I did it on a handful of songs. I like it. Like it's subtle, but it, yeah. I don't know. I think it adds. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and then the last thing was was the uh, the the, uh, the halftime tempo change uh, at the end of the song. Um, mm -hmm. It felt really or it felt really natural and organic. But I know you're recording to a click, so mm -hmm. um, do you do uh, like a, a set set your uh, do you do a tempo change in on your grid when you do something like that, or do you? Yeah, do for sure. So. Yeah, like, I think I decided to do it, like, I did scratch tracks for all these songs um, to record drums first. Sure. And then I don't, like, I don't really remember how it sort of came about, but I, was, I think I was just sitting there sort of messing around with it, and, like, just kind of the idea came, and I just, you know, I put the entire scratch track in um, um, flex time so I could change the time. Um, and I tried it and I'm like, Oh, this could be really cool. Um, and I showed it to my drummer and he's like, yeah, let's do it. And so, yeah, we just changed the, um, the tempo of the song and, and the actual track. And so, you know, the click slows down at that part for him and right. that way you can kind of snap everything to the grid. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's extremely important to, uh, <laughs> to maintain grid integrity. If you, if you want other, oh, yeah. <laughs> other people to play with it. You know? Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's that's a really cool track, and and it's a surprise to me because uh, I'm so accustomed to you know what you what you do with like landslide and, mm -hmm. and and some of the it's typically what I've seen is just you and a guitar, just being a songbird singing your singing your stuff. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, that one was definitely like probably a little outside of my comfort zone, especially from things I've done previously. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a fun, a fun change up. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so, uh, the next track, let's, let's, I, I bet you didn't notice. I, I know I was going to listen to it and hear your storm sound and make a comment on it. Did you? I, I actually <laughs> thought you might, and I was going to say something just when you were asking me like, a, you know, who played everything yeah. when we were playing it back, I was like, Oh yeah, I forgot I did that. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you ever do stuff like, um, I mean, it, uh, like going out into the wild and w- with a recorder and going, oh, I need that sound of that creek. Or have you ever done some yeah. stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, I'll just use my my iPhone. Um, I'm trying to think. Actually, you'll hear on the on the last song. Yeah, don't you'll tell me. I wanna, I wanna, that, yeah, I want to pick. Yeah. I want to see if I can pick it up. It's not subtle. You'll you'll pick it up right away. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, let's take a listen to uh, Wicked Man. Um, anything you want to say about this track before we go through it? Who is the Wicked Man? No, it's just the Wicked Man. Let's just listen to it. Okay. We'll, go, we'll go through it after. Yeah. All right, I like it. All right, here we go. Wicked Man from Mitch Fossier. Stubborn 
you got to be proud of this stuff, dude. It is so good. So good. Thanks, dude. Appreciate it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a fan. I've always been a fan, but I've never heard you um, this produced and, and thought out. I mean, you, you never gained, you know, I never heard sneak peeks of any of this stuff. Uh, so no, I'm not a sneak peek kind of guy. No, I just I like, like to wait and push it all out at the end. That's great. Um, so a couple things on this one. Uh, first off, uh, I played it on my front porch with a cup of coffee to, uh, to my wife prior to the show. And um, just listening to it on the phone, which is, by the way, the worst way an artist wants you to hear their material. <laughs> just, like, just, just for everybody out there. But um, right away, she was like, oh, my God, that's that. That's amazing. So uh, big win with the wife. That's step one. Love that. Um, the opening guitar. Uh, is that that nylon? Or is that a nylon? No. No, no, that's uh, it's a Martin. Uh, Mahogany oh, Martin. It's so warm. Um, is it, Are you using uh, an alternate tuning? It is a whole step down. Okay. Okay. So we're in, we're yeah. in D, but standard tuning. Yeah. Um, correct. Yeah. That, that, that guitar sounded so warm and, uh, you know, just really nice and thick. Um, then I'm listening to it. Your voice comes in again. Amazing. And then cellos or a string. Violin. Uh, that's a, okay. Violin. All right. Um, did they have to tune different or no okay no it's actually uh it's actually a fairly straightforward song um but I th like the people who who played on this song just like so genuinely couldn't have done a better job so i yeah like the the strings you hear throughout the entire it's just one singular violin although they're playing doubles for a lot of it so like in that in that first or second chorus when the whole band comes in um that's chris gustin playing doubles on the violin through that um and actually the violin it's funny i originally recorded the entire thing with with uh, a buddy named chris gustin and then i had to play this song live in maine um and i had someone play violin with me um her name is ryu mitsuashi and she she like did some things i just love i'm like hey can we get in the studio and record you know like just the way you played it and so it ended up sort of I used pieces from, from both of them. Um, but as a whole, it's like one violin going down the entire thing. It's just different parts are, you know, different parts of what they did. Um, but the, yeah, the, at the beginning of the song too, um, it's subtle, but I, I pitched wine glasses. Um, wow. So there's sort of like a little drone going so, throughout the entire song. All right. Now you're going, now, you, now you're going down the rabbit hole. I love of experimental stuff. Um, so when you say you pitched wine glasses, are you talking about you filled them with water so you can rub around the top to get that, that, yeah. and then you did that and you tuned it to D. Yeah. Sure. Like, you know, just you got a tuner out and like pour a little bit of that. All right. Yep, that's, <laughs> yeah. And so how, I did that. <laughs> how many tracks of wine glasses on this track, on this song? Uh, there's, there's a D note and an A note, uh, nice. I believe. If nice. I remember correctly, yeah, uh, but it's, it's mostly just at the beginning where you can hear it. Um, just I wanted, like, I like the idea of it just coming in, like, just you know, it's just the acoustic in my vocals at the beginning, but I don't know, just to give it a little more texture, mm. um, something subtle. So it's that the wine glasses, the acoustic in the beginning, yeah, and then, um, and then I hear piano, once comes the in. whole band comes in, yeah, yeah piano, yeah. bass, drums, violin. And then my guitar. That's that's what consists of the entire song. And then uh, there's actually there's a harmony too in the last chorus for the vocals. Vocal well. harmony. Yeah, I heard that. Um, so I also I also picked up possibly um, the acoustic guitar sounded a, a more like a, a steel string, brighter about midway towards the end of the song. It it wasn't that that nice, warm, rich intro sound were there two different guitar takes there was or different guitar just... takes for sure yeah. but if, i think it's really just a, a like a result of the way i was playing so i mean everything was uh finger picking at the beginning and then pick at the end um 
And then, yeah, it's like strumming at the end and just using more of my nails and kind of bringing out the high end of that guitar. Yeah, it, it's nice. I, I could, t I obviously heard heard the difference there. Um, let's see. Yeah, I, I, I at the end I had BGV background vocals. Uh, who who was that? Uh, Caroline Russell. Oh, nice. Okay. And yeah. was this all recorded in in Atlanta, or was this some of this in Maine, or? Uh. uh Almost all of it was recorded in Atlanta, with the exception of some of the violin was recorded in Maine. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. 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 It, you know, as musicians, um, I have no shame of seeing somebody uh, at, a, at a gig or, uh, or you know, performing or, or whatever going, hey, uh, I really like how you play. Yeah, you would, would you be in to come into the studio? Um, yeah, you know, how do you approach uh, uh, your your the the the, the violinist in Maine? Uh, was that a, a, a lady that you knew up there? Yeah, it was it was kind of funny. I had to uh, as a music minor in college, mm -hmm. um, and and simultaneously I was playing Division One college hockey, um, and so I couldn't like you have to have all these performance credits to graduate, sure. and they're on the weekend, and I had games, so I was like I like. I, I can't. Um, right. and so I went to the head of the department uh, and I was talking to him and I'm like, I, I don't really know what to do here, but like, I just can't go. It's like, I have games. There's nothing I can do. Right. He's like, all right, well we need to, you know, come up with something to kind of make up for that. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, uh, I'll accept like if you play a, a live show on campus um, and you know, like, you know, film it, bring people out or whatever, like I'll have that, you know, satisfy those, uh, those performance credits. So I was like, okay. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm trying to, like, we had a mutual friend, I guess, but she was actually, uh, she wasn't a student. She was a professor. Like oh, she wow. taught violin at the college. Yeah. So yeah, she was just phenomenal. Um, and yeah, I like reached out to her and I'm like, Hey, I know this is sort of random and kind of out of the blue, but like, would you have any interest in playing with me at this show? And she's like, yeah, no problem. And I'm like, uh, all right, great. So like got together with her, like literally like, I think twice before the show and just ran through the songs. And she's like, yep, got it, got it, got it. Like she yeah. was just, she was so good. It was, Bro, yeah. you know, everything's a joke for her. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we played the show. It was great. A whole lot of fun. Um, and then, yeah, afterwards I was like, gosh, I really loved what you did on this song. Um, is there any way we could record that? And again, she was like, yeah, no problem. Let's do it. So, um, yeah, super fortunate to have met her. She was super cool and just so so talented. Yeah. Well, that the 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 thing I was getting at is how do you you know how do you how do you ask somebody without being creepy or awkward? You know, as musicians, it's uh, it's almost like in hockey where you have locker room. Uh, you know, you have locker room guys that are always there for you, and then you know sometimes you might meet somebody and go, "Hey, I'd really like you to record." You know, asking them can be kind of awkward and 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 kind of weird um yeah yeah for sure um i think like the way i've done it now it was like harder it's a little easier now just because like i'm somewhat building somewhat of a catalog so it's right. like this is what i have like is this something that interests you yeah. um so it's a little easier but yeah it's definitely like i don't know it's almost like asking like a girl on a date or something i'm yeah. like hey, do you want to record on myself <laughs> yeah. yeah so yeah um but I know, at that point, it was just honestly the weird part for that was asking her to play the show with me in general. Right. Um, so I, yeah, after that it was easy. But the yeah, with a lot of people, like I um, actually, it's it's funny. I don't think the three songs that we're going through today have any pedal steel on them. But there's a handful of other songs on the record that have pedal steel. Um, and the the guy who did that did such a great job. Now, um, is he in Atlanta? He is in Athens, Georgia. Okay. Uh, so he's a few hours away. Um, and he, you know, he tours for a living. He's um, super, super good musician. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, reaching out to him was kind of weird. I was like, hey, um, yeah, that's what you, you got to do. I commission, can I commission you to play on some of these songs? And, but I, I don't know. Most, most people are nice. So it's a little weird, but yeah. whatever. You know, that, yeah, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like ordering a pizza. Um, <laughs> You know, if you want to have a couple of extra ingredients on a song, it's going to cost you. You know, sure. it, it's not, I mean, musicians, 
you know, they're trying to, to make a living and, um, you know, it, people like I, you know, I just hired a guy to play lap steel on a track and, you know, it's the best money I've ever spent because it sounds so good to get somebody that is, you know, a pro at that instrument playing what you need for that track. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't have to say a number, but you've invested money, good money into getting these songs done, right? Sure. Yeah. And I mean, I've been fortunate in a lot of ways, like a lot of the people that played on these songs are like my friends right. and they're like, you know, they don't want a dime. Um, and I try to, you know, I try to pay them when I can, but yeah, they're just like, I have so many friends who are like legitimately like, I'm like, it's crazy that I have this many friends that are like this good at music. Right. Um, and that are like willing to help me out. So it's been awesome, but you know, definitely you're right with, you know, it's not like, I don't, I didn't have a friend who was, a pedal steel player at the time. And so like, yeah, you've got to commission people right? You know, to do that if you want a good product. And it's like, yeah, for me, it's like it's not a question. It's worth every penny I send right. or spend. Sorry. And it's like, um, yeah, yeah. You gotta, you gotta pay for what you want for yeah. sure. Whether like gear and players and like you can't, and I said that a little earlier, like just as like the recording process, there's so much nuance to it. It's like, you know, you have to have a great performance to have a great performance. You have to have a great player and it has to be on a great instrument. It has to be in a great space, you know, like you be a great player and a great instrument, but if it's not like a well acoustically, you know, somewhat treated space, like it's, you're going to get weird room resonances when you record and then you have to have a good microphone and then a good, you've got to make sure your cables are good. And then it goes into the preamp, good preamp interface. A lot, like you yeah. just one thing after another, right? Like you just, if you cheat any of those, like, it's going to show up in the recording. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, all of those things have to go into the, uh, to the cake for it to be really good. Um, sure. And then what? Um, you've recorded it. Do you do your own mastering of the track? Or do you send that out? Yeah, I did. Uh, actually, that was part of like when I went through the process the first time and kind of finished it. And I was like, oh, I'm so, so unhappy with this. Yeah. Um, it was like during the mastering stage. And, um, so I ended up taking uh, a course on mastering, um, which was super eye opening. Like, I think like I have a pretty good feel for mastering now, but it also, I feel like people have just unrealistic expectations for mastering. And I guess it made me realize like some of the mistakes I was making in every yard that were part of the process. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, by the end of it, I, uh, you know, mixed, produced, and mastered everything. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, uh, any plugins in particular that you lean on for your mastering process? I'm an isotope guy. I like I like ozone and. Yeah, I actually I've never gone into ozone. Um, I've heard nothing but good things, but for for this um, project, I'm trying to think. Um, all the EQing, I think, like by the time like i went back and everything i was super like i didn't want to do a lot of eqing in the mastering process um so i was pretty pretty in tune with that when i was kind of remixing everything so um gosh i wish i had a session up right now um what did i use you know what there's a great i i do remember what i did so like there's a great uh plug-in by slate mm -hmm. um i wish i remember what it was called i mean you could easily find it it's there like um is it the virtual rack no it's the it's their like compressor and limiter and it's like a com like the plugin has both of it in them but i think i use that on almost every track it does such a great job of like bringing loudness out of a track without squashing yeah. the dynamics um so i used a lot of that i used a plug-in by kush audio called uh clarifonic um to get a little high end out of it and that's it's like a high end saturation plug in. Um by high end I mean like high end of the frequency spectrum. Yeah. yeah. Um uh a lot of the tracks came in super quiet. So I was using uh Saturn two, I believe, by is that Fab Filter? Um just to get a little more loudness before I started feeding it into some of the uh, dynamic plugins. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's such a great plugin that I used. Um, gosh, I'm blanking on all these names. Uh, Oxford inflator. 
Um, I don't know if you've ever used that, but yeah. what a great, great tool to bring out loudness. Um, and I, I think it's pretty much like upward compression, but it does it such like it, it just makes it louder without you really like, again, like it doesn't sound like the dynamics are yeah. squashed. It doesn't sound like you're losing punch or anything like that. Um, those are, those are the ones that come to mind right now. It was pretty, it wasn't too complicated what I did. Um, I didn't use too many, um, didn't use too many tools kind of stuck to what I was using. It's just kind of kept you, it simple for the most yeah, part. You, the, um, uh, like in ozone it's one plug in that has you know a tool yeah. box, a toolbox of things it sounds like to me that you've kind of used kind of created your own kind of signal chain sure um so you would start with uh with the loudness and then do i started with i guess i would start with eq like on some of them i rolled off just like a like under 20 hertz yeah um but i don't know it's funny like in theory that should get rid of some some just of the sound going into your compressor but that's not always the case yeah um but you know it was eq and then i think i went into the uh oxford inflator and then into or sorry no eq then i ran it through the um the saturn plugin which is technically a saturation plugin but it was pretty much just to get volume up so it was like a subtle amount of saturation um and then I was just pumping the gain up on it big time to get yeah. the, get the song to an appropriate level. And then that was going to my compressor. Um, and, and limiter. Yeah. Um, oh, and sorry, one other plugin that I should mention too, that was, that I think is just, you know, is so vital to the mastering process, um, is a clipper. Um, yeah. yeah, just to get loudness. I mean, there's so many transients that are like, you know, can stick out by, you know, a couple dB that you take that away with a clipping plugin and you literally cannot hear the difference. You're just yeah. getting rid of loudness and that affects how it goes into that compressor and that limiter so much. Um, so that was another so big you'd piece put of that puzzle. before your compressor. I'd put that before my compressor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, it's, uh, it's alchemy, audio alchemy, uh, coming up with your processes and, and learning what, what ingredient to put in the potion so that it doesn't explode, you know? Um, yeah. But most of the mastering process is typically, like you said, to, to, to get your levels, um, uh, up and even all the way throughout the song. Um, have you, uh, I mean, and, and like you said, you can really ruin the cake in that process. Uh, going too hard or, or, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's very easy to mess up and have to start over. The, the nice thing is that it's pretty easy to start back over. Um, when you, when you mix your track, you said it was kind of low. Um, you, you tend to, when you're wanting to send it to mastering, you tend to want to have it, you know, negative six, maybe, um, just to give them the room to be able to do what you're talking about. Are you saying to make it, are you saying, do I want to have it louder or? No, like when I mix a song down and I'm getting ready to go into my mastering process, I, you know, I don't run it up to, you know, zero. Oh yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So yeah, no, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I was, if anything, I want it more quiet right. just because then you've got more headroom to, to do what you want to do. So yeah, I would definitely take a song, like a lot of the songs that I, and granted I was doing the whole process, but even if I was, you know, sending it out to a mastering engineer, at least from what I've learned, you know, I'd much rather have a lot more headroom because you can, you know, unless it's you know outrageously quiet where you're bringing up the noise floor too much that's sure. in today's world that's typically not that much of a problem just with how good audio gear is in general um but yeah i'd have i'd prefer to have more headroom because you can get creative with the way you turn that volume up like it's not just a volume switch now you can do it with saturation and, and different types of saturation that can you know um not only control dynamics in a certain sense but it can give you can soften a song out and I don't know. There's just, it gives you a lot more, uh, creative ability, I would say. Yeah. Uh, what do you peek out at? What, what, when you, uh, what do you, are you, uh, two questions. Are you, um, are you still working in uh, DB or are you doing working with Luffs, which is a new thing Both. to me? Uh, I mean, as far as like your overall 
yeah, like a, a when you upload all these streaming services, they're going to look at lofts for sure. Um, so, but I mean, I'm monitoring all of those, um, you know, those different measurements, I guess. Yeah. But the song, as far as it's peaking at, I don't know, like, and they change so much, like what you know, Spotify asks for and Apple Music and all the other streaming platforms. But I, with this, I had everything peak at negative one decibels yep, that's right. and the lofts ranged from anywhere from probably I didn't push it too much just cause I knew like I wasn't going to, I have no intentions of really putting this on CD um, or vinyl. And if I do, I'll go back and master, you know, a different, yeah. different version of it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think the songs range from anywhere from like, um, negative nine to negative 14 lofts, um, negative 14 lofts, obviously being on the quieter side. And those songs that were that low were, you know, bare instruments right. on those songs. So yeah. it's, you, you really couldn't push it much harder than that. Sure. Um, okay. So now you've written, I mean, just going through the steps, you've, you've written a great idea. You've taken the time to capture all the instrumentation in order to make this, a song um you've mixed it you've mastered it um now what so you, are you going to put it on spotify it's already on spotify correct yeah it's it's out pretty much anywhere um any major music listening platform it's it's there um so yeah you know uploaded through a distribution company this is are you, i'm an independent artist yep who are you sorry who are you yeah. who are you using for your- i use TuneCore. Oh, okay. Two corners. That's who we have been using. I'm looking yep. at some other options, though, actually now, um, because there are, I mean, it it costs the same amount of money to distribute distribute through TuneCore annually, right? So say it's, I think, you know, 50 or 60 bucks to do an album or whatever. I think it's $50 a year for TuneCore right now. Yeah. Um, and, and where I'm going with this is now you have to put on your marketing hat right? You've released, mm-hmm. you've, you've written the album, you've recorded it, you know, now we've shoved it up into the internet. Now, you know, now you have to promote it. I mean, we, we, I don't have a record label. You have to be your own record label, right? So mm-hmm. do, what are your plans? Do you have any, have any plans on how you're going to approach that, that side of it? Yeah, I'm, I'm about to start sort of the, the process of that. And by start the process of that, I mean start studying the process of that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I know in an ideal world, this is something you should know before you release anything. But, um, yeah, I, I actually, like, literally just signed up last night to, like, take a course on sort of uh, music marketing. Um, so, I know, I mean... Yeah, there's a million different things you can do, and I think you can definitely get down the rabbit hole of that as well. But uh, that's something I'm definitely like not well versed in. Um, so far, like I just like there's a quote unquote promotional video I put out on like Instagram, mm-hmm. um, and just with sort of my hockey background, I mean that's circulated a li- like nothing crazy, but I think it has like fifty thousand views, so that generated a little bit of tra- traffic um, just sort of organically. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I would definitely like to get more into sort of the nitty gritty of it and, you know, not opposed to, you know, paid promotion by any means. Right. Um, as long if as it's paying, appropriate if, or legitimate, like if I, it's I, making its money back. Yeah. Well, yeah, not even that. I, uh, I used, uh, a promote, a, a paid promotion, uh, g- guy on the internet to, uh, to help with the podcast, uh, reach and, you know, did half the work, took all the money, and now ghosted me. You know, so uh, finding a legit- yeah, there's a lot of shady stuff out there. Yeah, for sure. Finding a legit- and there's a lot of fake stuff out there. Yeah, you like you don't. It's not like I think a lot of musicians sort of get um, caught up in maybe you know the social cloud of it all. Like, oh, I want this many streams. And it's like if those aren't real streams, first of all, it's illegal. Uh, and second of all, like, who cares? Like, yeah, no one's really listening to your music. So yeah, no, like it's, you know, you want to find people who genuinely like your music. Um, and that's how you can be more successful at it. So yeah, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, I am just, just now, or I should, I'm about to, I guess, sort of start the process of, yeah. of learning more about that. And yeah, I'll go from there. Well, like I said, it's, uh, putting on another hat, you know, you had to, 
Yeah, big time. You know, how how many hats is that? That's a uh, writer, uh, uh, producer, uh, master. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's it's out of, out of control. Uh, going back to the tune core thing, we've been using them for years, and um, you know, it, fifty dollars a year doesn't sound like a lot until you're seventeen years into it, and you're like, wait a minute, why am I still paying for an, a record I did so long long ago? There are a couple other distribution companies that I've just learned about through people on the podcast that uh, instead of paying that $50 a year, they take a, uh, an eight or a 10% of the revenue. Sure. Uh, but it stays up in perpetuity. Right. So I don't know about you, but when I'm getting paid 0. 0.000033 cents a stream on, on a, on a song, it, it takes, you know, a million streams to make $10 or whatever it is. Uh, I'm not making that sure. $50 back. I may as well uh, give this guy 10% of 0. 0.0003. Right. So, yeah, there's, yeah. So I sort of just went through the process of that. Um, like I used to use CD baby yep. for a previous release. Um, and that's kind of what you're describing. It's well, it's a one-time fee of whatever it is now. And then, but they take like maybe it's nine percent of your streaming royalties. Right. Um, I guess for me, I am trying to think of it more in the long run, and like you hope you have success, and it's like if I do have success, well, it's fifty dollars a year. Right. And it's too. I know. So like TuneCore, I don't know how long you've been using them, but they used to do. It's fifty dollars per release per year. So if you had 10 releases out, you know, that's $500 a year. But now, and I assume you're over to the other where now it's just $50 a year for unlimited releases. Um, so I don't know. For me, I like the fact that you're keeping all of your royalties. And yeah. um, I, it is, don't get me wrong, like, you know, streaming pays so poorly. But at the same time, streaming does open the door for a lot of potential growth as well. Like I remember I put out um, an EP like a while ago. Um, and it was, I had a song though that got picked up by like, you know, one of those Spotify playlists and it ended up getting like 200, 300,000 streams. Right. Um, and you know, that pays, pays that back for itself pretty quickly. So I don't know, I guess sure. $50, I mean, over the long run, but at the same time, it's only $50 a year. I guess the way I see it, it's like, if I, you know, if I'm fortunate enough to have some success at it, I would like to keep the money that I do make. So, yeah, I don't know. I think in the long run, it's probably not that big of a deal either way. Yeah. I'm looking at, um, you know, we have, we have a website, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, you know, we can, we can host our music on the website and they can stream it or they can purchase it for, you know, the old 99 cent thing. Um, and just trying to do ad campaigns to drive traffic to that instead of to Spotify. I, you know, I, I'm not sure, you know, the, the best approach on it, but it, it is all about marketing and how, how you get your music in front of, you know, as many ears as, as you can and, and, and hope to drum up, you know, the, the, the traffic that way. Yeah. Yeah. I know. That's an interesting thought. I like, I don't know the way I see it right now. And again, like I'm so unknowledgeable on the subject, but it's like, yeah. at least for me, when I hear a song, it's like, if I, I want my music to be where the music listeners are. And right now I feel like they're on the streaming services and yeah, I yeah. somewhat wish that wasn't the case. Although, I mean, as a consumer, it's great because you have everything, you know, one click away. But, um, as an artist, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's it's not ideal for an artist as far as making money goes. But for fan growth, like, it actually can be pretty beneficial. So, I don't know. Like I said, I've got a lot of research to do. Yeah. Um, so that's what's up on my plate, you know, coming up here. Yeah, it's Catch-22 for sure. Um, yeah, yeah, it is. Well, let's check, out the, let's check out the last track here. It's called That's Enough. Um, oh, and, and back to the Wicked Man. I think I know who it is. Oh, the, the, what the song's about? Yeah, yeah. The song's actually, it's about, uh, the song's actually about my grandparents. Um, but I guess conceptually, it's sort of about the idea of wanting someone um, 
for for them and all their flaws and maybe the resistance to change and the idea of like like the chorus is I'm a wicked man no good at who I am I'd love the difference if the difference wasn't me and it's like I guess maybe just what are you willing to sacrifice for someone essentially yeah well, yeah you're a heavy one Mitch <laughs> <laughs> these are my these are my late night thoughts when I, I, like I have a, when I have my sad boy guitar in my hand yeah uh, let's talk about that before we listen to this let's talk about that Martin it was probably maybe I don't even know three months ago four months ago uh, you and I were texting and you were asking me, you know, thoughts on uh, a high quality guitar. I don't think you're going to get any better than a Martin, but is that, uh, is that what you, that's what you landed on? Uh, the Mar- I've had the Martin for a while. The Martin is what I recorded the whole album with. Right. Um, so I've had, I've had that for, for probably five years. Yeah. And then I just added another guitar to my arsenal. Um, that's the one. The, yeah. The Martin. It, yeah. Yeah. That's the one I was texting you about. I ended up getting uh, it's an Eastman. Um, I don't even know what the model name is, but it's just something a little brighter. So the Martin is a, I think it's D15, it's a cutaway too, D15CE, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, all mahogany, beautiful guitar, plays yeah. plays so nice. Um, it's very dark though, just you know the nature of mahogany, and yeah. like you kind of alluded to it with Wicked Man, like that, acu- especially with it being a whole step down too. But it's very warm. Um, it has a beautiful quality to it, but it's also, it's, it's not going to be something else. So yeah, I ended up getting a guitar too, just for different application sake. That's a little brighter, yeah. uh, resonates a little more to, like mahogany doesn't resonate all that much. It has a super sure. woody tone, which again, for the right application, it's beautiful, but, um, yeah. Yeah. That thing sounded like a nylon. Um, it was so warm. Uh, what? Yeah. Well, I did use one of your nylons on yeah. the song on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what, uh, what, what strings are you using? Um, you have a preference? I've always just used, and actually I think they like, they didn't discontinue them, but I think they changed the names, but the, like the Adario, just medium, um, bronze. Yeah. I, I, I usually get them coded just cause I am too lazy to change them. But when I record, I don't think I got them coded. Um, but I don't know, again, I recorded that a while ago, so yeah. hard to remember. Yeah, like the elixirs when you're talking about coding, you tried those. Yes, or I, I yeah, but elixirs used to be its own elixir and like it's Diodario, right? Am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah, Diodario, D, yeah, Diodario. I don't yeah. know, uh, but I think those used to be like two separate. I want to say like they're now like they've merged or whatever, but mm. elixirs, I feel like at least they used to be have like a little more like more of a scoop. Yeah, um, where the Diodarios were more. Right. Mid range. Yeah. I, uh, um, yeah. I, I've tried the elixirs in the past and, and I, I liked them because they lasted a long time. Um, I, you know, I don't play acoustic guitar that much, not nearly as, as much as you do. Um, but yeah, I just go with phosphorus bronze and, you know, yeah, kind of light gauge and yeah. Yeah. I use a lot of open tuning, so I can't like the light gauge for it makes them easier to play for sure but um i've sort of shifted towards sort of heavier strings just because i do use use a lot of open tunings and i tend like there's a lot of songs i play that are a whole step down yeah um just for fit, whatever reason it's your voice probably yeah just because it fits my voice yeah and i which yeah i don't even know because so many of them are in different keys but what happens is i always write these songs and i'm like living with people so I write it like just sort of like humming and like head voice to myself. And then I go to play it and I'm like, I can't even see my, sing my own song. Yeah. yeah. So um, I've got to bump it down. Now, do you, when you do these alternate tunings, do you have guitars that stay in certain tunings? Um, or do you have to switch each time or? Uh, when I'm just writing, I'll normally like leave one of them in that alternate tuning that I'm doing. But then obviously when I'm recording, just whichever guitar that I feel like, you know, suits the application best. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, it. Gets a little crazy around here. I'm looking at the wall, and I've got. Uh, yeah, you're you know, thinking which ones in which tuning. Yeah, yeah, this one's in that tuning. This one's in that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, yeah, they pick on me, and I've talked about this be- before. My buddies come over, and they're like, well, "All right, which guitar here is in standard uh, for 440A?" <laughs> and I was like, "None of them." <laughs> well, there's one. I got one that's in standard. Uh, 
but I, I yeah, do because all yours are in drop D and drop C. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, they're 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 just so fun in that tuning. I'm sorry, <laughs> they're just fun. Um, well, let's check out uh, this track. The last track here is uh, "That's Enough." Um, is this uh, how many songs are on the record? This is number nine, I think. I think eleven. Okay. Um, yeah. And by the way, I think this is a drop D tuning for you, if I remember correctly. All right. And there was something else I was supposed to listen for in this one. So here we go. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Another hit there, dude. Uh, I, I'll say that you have figured out your orchestration that really works for your compositions, uh, meaning that the instrument choices that you're using um, just fit so well with, with the, the mood of the song, the tone of your voice. Uh, it's re really well done, dude. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, this one... <clears throat> the background vocal harmonies on the chorus is uh, uh, kind of bring me back to a like a Simon and Garfunkel type of era stacked harmony. It was like a harmony going on with the background vocal. What, who was that, all that singing? Uh, that was like six different versions of me. Okay. Um, Dude, so good. Yeah, so I think I did the back. I did all the harmony on that one. Um, but yeah, in the chorus, I think there's there's the main vocals and then maybe like five harmonies, I think. Yeah. Well, 
I mean, I hope you paid those guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I pay them all the royalties on those Spotify yeah. streams. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, and, and that's that's the nice thing also about being able to do everything yourself. Um, if it just needed, you know, you probably got to number three on that harmony and we're like third take, you know, third stack and like, man, that sounds pretty good. What would happen if I did another yeah. one? Hmm. Yeah. What would happen? Um, so when you're doing that, if you've got f- five layers, are you, are you singing in a, a specific, uh, harmony or do you just sing, sing, uh, how do you approach stacking a, a harmony vocal like, like that? I would approach it differently now. I think at the time it was probably more experimental. I think I just recorded a harmony and then I recorded another one. And I'm like, all right, like, let me try a few more, but like, let me figure out what I've done so far. It's okay. Like, this is the third, the fifth. Let me try like an octave under that. Yeah. We did like a higher, like, so yeah, I start to like organize them kind of where they fit in on on the scale. Um, but it was, it was definitely just a lot of experimentation and kind of just, there wasn't a whole lot of, um, rhyme or reason to what I was doing. I would say it was just sort of feeling it out. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it, it, it's, it's got a sound, it, it, it's got a sound that was familiar enough to, it was like, man, that's, you know, sounded like that kind of, what would you describe your, your music is? Is it folk? Is it Americana? Is it Mitch? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly uh man i've always had such a hard time answering this question yeah. um so yeah i don't i don't know exactly what it falls under which maybe is a problem i might need to figure that out um but i mean yeah i don't, I don't know i guess it's rooted in singer songwriter but maybe branches out like there's definitely some folky um influences and um you know a few of the songs have like a little more you know th- twang to them with like you know again like there's pedal seal on a lot of them so those have like a little bit of a country twist to them yeah and then you know a song like give me some more has a little bit like you know mellow rock feel um so i, I, I don't felt, know i felt uh, probably before your time but i felt wallflowers type of vibe on the on that track give me some more like that, that's fair you know that kind of like you said it's 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 like it's rock it's kind of light rock and it's, yeah yeah, that is kind of, you know, I I hate asking that question because um, I hate to be asked that question. Oh, what, would you, what style is your music? What would you, what does it sound like? Um, you know, it, it's kind of one of the hardest things to answer about your own, you know, your your own music. It's like asking, a, yeah, which kid do you like best if you had three kids? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I really I really don't know like if and maybe that's a setback or maybe it's not i'm not sure but i don't know i yeah i've, I've never really been super intentional too about like i'm gonna write songs in this style i've always just sort of like written songs and then recorded them the way that i think feels appropriate um as far as instrumentation um and sort of style yeah well like i said i think you you've you've figured out the ingredients of your cake as far as uh you know the type of instruments uh you know organic organic sounding instruments uh, really make this stuff work um, on that track uh, that's enough you've got uh, a finger picking acoustic guitar kind of starts off and about midway through or I, I don't know when it started might I heard the I heard the sweep I heard this the the frequency rumble this one was a rumble yeah there's a rumble yeah yeah there's just a straight low end <laughs> yeah yeah um but at some point a second acoustic guitar uh started matching the main guitar and it sounded like it was playing a harmony or a secondary part there's uh yeah so there's the the main acoustic that goes throughout the entire thing and then after that first chorus uh kind of when that rumble comes in yeah. and there's some other samples there's like a music box that's like super buried under the mix uh as well as like some like flute sounding instrument that i kind of got i think i got off like native instruments or something um but there's two acoustic harmonies that are panned each way yep. um so it's three acoustics playing for like the second half of the song okay and, and are they playing uh the different parts or is uh yeah they're playing like counter like uh, the harmonies yeah. of of what i'm playing yeah it sounds so good um when you're recording guitars like that, uh, you know, people don't understand how 
articulate you have to be to be on the grid to finger pick and have it sound good <laughs> you know <laughs> it's it's hard to do and then it's, yeah it's even harder to do for i don't know how long that track was but three minutes and 36 seconds you know it, well, it was comped for sure. But yeah, no, I mean, there's a rhythmic element to it as well that like people, you know, you probably don't think of when you hear like a, a, a minor key acoustic song like that, but just with like sort of the finger picking that's going on when you have three of them going on, it kind of, especially with like headphones on, there's sort of like a bounce back and forth within yeah. your ears. And if you don't have it pretty, pretty tight, it's going to be a mess unpleasing for sure yeah unpleasing that's that's a nice way to say it's gonna suck yeah <laughs> yeah um so those guitars come in uh and i really like that I, that sounded i i my ears perked up uh but then these low um piano stabs uh, that whole notes that boom mm -hmm. really start bringing up uh the intensity of the track uh was that you playing the piano on that as well I think so. It's, it's so like, <laughs> it's yeah. funny. I had, uh, I was talking about this with my buddy the other day. I played like probably half the piano and then my buddy played the other half of the piano on the record. Yeah. Um, but there was like crossover and like, I think I played that, but I really don't remember. We were kind of sitting in the room, yeah. uh, you know, do, doing different versions, different takes. And so, um, he was laughing at that too. He's like, he called me on a song. He's like, dude, did I play on this song? I'm like, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. So, it's funny when you go back, uh, and, and, and that's, uh, you know, I do my best when I'm doing, you know, Hope's Anchor Records or whatever to try to make sure that I, you know, in the liner notes, get everybody who did something on it, you know, give them, yeah, credit, you know, for sure. Yeah, no, that was, that was Caleb Chauncey playing, playing a lot of those keys on that. He, he did a great, like on Wicked Man, he played the keys on that. I do remember that because it was pretty unique melody that he was playing that kind of went along with the guitar and um man yeah everyone who played on it on the record did such a nice job yeah um you know it's always fun to me when when you have a musician that just another brain in the room um thinking about the same you know you know entering into the sonic world of a song uh, and just having somebody, another brain's perspective of what could be here that, that I would, you know, I, I would never think of doing that. And I love it. You know, that's mm -hmm. the beauty of collaboration is having uh, multiple perspectives of, you know, a, a, an idea, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. It's it's so cool to see, like, you know, the first song gave me some more, like my friend Isaac George played played the riff on that and the solo and like it totally changed the dynamic of the song and it was something I hadn't really like considered it, it yeah you're right it's so cool to see like you know something you create um kind of become something else in yeah. like the coolest way possible it's like oh my gosh this makes it so much better yeah um yeah it's it's awesome to see and it's pretty much etched in time uh, you know all of these things yeah. uh all you know that's one of the reasons not one of the reasons but a reason that I got into music was, I mean, my, my dad was a musician, my mom was as well, uh, was to write and record and copyright something that'll live forever. Yeah. It's, a, you know, a, it's kind of a, a legacy art kind of a thing. Um, totally. Yeah. That, I've always thought the same thing. Like, it, it's, at least for me, like, there's obviously it's sort of like the long term thing like that, but even just, you know, over the course of my own life, like, I feel like, songs I've written really like for me, like almost document parts of my life where I can like look back and hear a song. And it's like, I know exactly where it's at, like mm -hmm. what I was thinking, what I was feeling in this moment in time. It has like such a cool way of like, it's like, you know, an autobiography in, in a sense. Yeah. A sonic biography. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question. I always like to ask this question. Um, and, you've already kind of alluded to it, but outside of music and writing and recording and doing all this, um, you know, you have any other passions and talents and you've already kind of alluded to it. Um, uh, you are a professional hockey player. Yes. And, uh, you are playing, uh, out of Atlanta now. Yeah. You, this is your first year with them. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I got traded here over the summer. So yeah, outside of music, I, I'm a professional hockey player currently. Um, I've, I've played all over, um, it seems like. Uh, this yes. is my fourth year pro. Nice. Um, but yeah, my first year I was in uh, Rockford, Illinois, which is uh, the Chicago Blackhawks um, American League team. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was over in Europe for a little bit. Um, and then I was in Portland, Maine, um, a quick cup of coffee in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and now I'm in Atlanta. Um, so, which is where I'm originally from. So, yeah. Right. Which works out cause you can let, you can actually be at home, right? Exactly. And I can you can play be, a little more music. You can so. be in your <laughs> studio. I mean, that just totally makes exactly. sense. Um, it's great. Yeah. In, in all of your years, I mean, you've been playing hockey now. I, uh, how, how many years since you were eight? I'm 26, uh, probably since I was six. We'll call it 20 years. Yeah, 20 years, right? Um, and in that time, you know, you've got to see a lot uh, that you probably never would have seen, like, you know, your time in Europe. Where were you at in Europe? I live in Slovakia. Um, got to travel a lot, though. It's a cool experience. Yeah, so um, when you say travel a lot, is that the ability to jump on a Eurail and go just – see something that you never would have seen yeah like i just i think you know living over there um specifically i guess where i was at and the group of people i was with like i traveled to places that i would have never even thought to have traveled like i remember my first week in europe um and again you know living there playing hockey so you get these breaks and some of my teammates were like yeah let's go to krakow and i'm like where where like krakow poland and i'm like doesn't sound all that cool to be honest. And they're like, no, trust me. And like, man, were they right? What a cool, cool city. Um, and just like, yeah, like we went, like, I feel like we go to these places that like, I just never, you know, like normally people go and they go to Rome and, yeah. you know, they go to the Amalfi coast and, uh, they go to Paris, right. And not in places are awesome for sure. But, um, you know, doing it in sort of this, setting playing hockey or whatever you know go to places that um i probably would have never otherwise gone because just because they're maybe not quite as known but i'm also going with people who like have been before and sure. who like know know the spots to go so you get kind of like a cool more like local yeah. feel of some of these these cities which is which is really cool now when you were when you were bouncing around and, and doing those adventures did you ever find yourself with an acoustic guitar in your hand with somebody that didn't even speak your language and, uh, you know, in a coffee shop or anything? I don't think so. I found myself in a couple like jazz clubs, which were so cool. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, my my teammates weren't into it as I was. I'm right. like, let's stay. They're like, yeah. no, let's go to the club. Yeah. I'm like, this is so much better. Right. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, no, when we were traveling, we were traveling light. Um it's possible. Definitely like found myself in like with a piano or two. Right. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, I mean, that is part of the, part of the uh, fun of traveling just, you know, especially with guys like that, like it's sort of an adventure in the sense of like, you know, any night you could end up anywhere and you meet these people. And yeah. like, I remember um, maybe it was in like pra or no, it was in Bruno or something in the Czech or something. We ended up, running into these people from the Netherlands. We ended up you're like, you guys want to go for dinner? And I'm like, sure. I'm like you just, I don't know. It's cool. It's fun. You yeah. have these super weird, like wake up the next morning. I'm like, was that a dream? But it's like, no, oh, it's cool. It's a cool perspective shift and gives you an appreciation for, uh, for the world and for traveling and for other cultures. And I don't know. It was, it was really cool. Yeah. Cause in the end of the day, <clears throat> they're just, they're just, uh, you know, humans living in a different piece of ground on the planet trying to get through their life just like we are here you know um yeah yeah that's that's awesome you know music can be like that too if you're if you get have an opportunity to get out and tour um you know whatever town you might be playing in two things ask a local where to get where to but you know the best food um yeah and and venture off the beaten path away from like, like 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 you said if you you know, it's hard to venture away from New York City if you're in New York City. But, you know, go and explore different different small towns outside of these tourist towns. Yeah. And you'll meet really Not cool that people. there's, you know, the tourist towns are cool too. But no, you're right. It's a, it's, it's cool to find yourself amongst 
a bunch of locals. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, Mitch. I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with, with, with this record. Uh, it's on Spotify under Mitch Fossier, correct? Yep. And that's F O S S I E R. Um, and, and just keep doing it. You know, you got through this one, do your marketing class, give me some pointer. <laughs> hey, when you come, when you get done with that, let's uh, have you back on. And, and I think that would be very helpful if you, uh, uh, you know, the mastering stuff today was very helpful. I took a bunch of notes. Um, and you know, this is a place to just come share your, your, you know, share your thoughts on, uh, your approach to writing and recording and, and, uh, you know, doing this whole thing. Yeah, man. Well, appreciate you having me. It was fun. All right. Well, let's grab a meal sometime soon and uh, I'll see you around the rinks. Sounds good. All right, Mitch. Have a good day. You're watching the Original Music Podcast with your hosts Raymond Hems and Rick Gaffman.